Hey everyone, Luke here from Bedford Camera and Video, and I've got Sony Artisan, Patrick Murphy Racy, and Sony Pro Support Manager, Michael Bubalo. So we're gonna be talking about the new um, Sony A7S III. So guys, just kind of tell me a little bit about uh, who you are and what you guys do. Awesome. I guess I'll go first. I'm a Sony Artisan uh, since about 2014, I think. And uh, I've owned both prior models of the S, the sensitivity camera. Um, so I'm very excited about um, the S3. It's a long time coming and a lot of people are finally able to say, oh yeah, they, they finally made it. So it's really good, it's really good. I, I should say also, I'm primarily known as a still photographer, but I do a ton of video. So this camera is one I'm gonna buy for sure and I will use it often. And I'm Mike Bubalo. I manage the pro support team in the United States. And what pro support is, is that we offer a network of, of um, technicians throughout the country that are there to support the professionals in the field. So we're your personal connection to Sony in the field. Um, if you need questions or you need gear or just any assistance setting up anything or just general questions in general and, and overall, we're the ones in the field that will be able to help you out. So that being said, I, one of my best parts of my job is working events and listening to the voice of the customer. And when we listen to the voice of the customer, we listen to thousands of professionals voices. We deal with a lot of professional videographers, stills photographers, DPs, cinematographers. Um, and this camera is really the culmination of that feedback. It's kind of the culmination from my team and the teams that go out there and the engineers feedback is we put into the Alpha 7S Mark III to make this a really purpose built camera because when at Sony, we think of that user and then we create the best possible product for them. And to me, this, the Alpha 7S series uh, has always been my camera of a choice. I've always loved the Alpha 7S Mark II. But then, you know, within the last five years, we've come out with a ton of cameras that just autofocus like lightning and the best in the industry. So I kind of put that camera away and I really started predominantly shooting the Alpha 9 Mark II. But now that this camera has came out with the autofocus that it has and the system that rivals the fastest in the world, which is the Alpha 9 Mark II, this is my new, you know, favorite camera because it allows me to shoot wherever I want, however I want and have the highest so performance and dynamic range that just... It's something that I've never had before. No one in the industry has had before. So I'm like really pumped about this camera. So it was exciting when all of a sudden I just got an email saying, hey, FedEx is going to deliver something today. I had no idea what it was. It was from Sony. So, you know, I get packages all the time. So I go on my front porch and I, you know, I open it right there on the spot. And I take it out. I'm like, oh my God, it is finally here. After five years, I can finally start to talk to customers eventually about the new Alpha 7S Mark II because... You like just you like you PMR. I mean, the last five years, every question that I get is, so where's the Alpha 7S Mark III? Yeah. Where is it? Yeah. So, and I always said, we just don't have, we're making it, we're working on it. We just don't have the technology yet to give you the best possible product, but it's here now. And I, I'm excited to talk about it. That's awesome. So I guess we're going to, let's go ahead and dive into a little bit about the camera itself. So tell me what sensor and tell me about the sensor that they have in the A7S III. Absolutely. So it's a brand new back illuminated 12 megapixel sensor. And the reason why we chose this resolution is because it enables us to do several things. It enables us to do, give you the best possible 4K image quality. It enables us to get the best high ISO performance, really high dynamic range, but also very fast readout speeds in the sensor, giving us much faster rolling shutter and much faster readout speeds than we've ever had on any of our cameras before. So it is backside illuminated. And what that means is, believe it or not, a lot of other manufacturers and other sensors that are out there, all the wiring are actually in between the light sensitive pixels. So that way your pixels are smaller and they're also the light sensitive materials even smaller. So what we did was we actually just moved all that wiring underneath. So that way now, not only do you have these huge pixels because they're 12 megapixels, but we're getting even bigger photodiodes, more light gathering because we moved those electronics underneath. And it's still something that most people aren't doing at this point. And because it's 12 megapixels, 
we're able to get full pixel 4K readout in all shooting modes, which is also not normal for this industry to be able to have no line skipping, no pixel binning, full pixel readout in all modes, including full HD, so we can upsample from eight megapixels. But again, we're able to scan that sensor so fast, not just because of 12 megapixels, but the new Bions XR processing engine, we're able to have almost no rolling shutter whatsoever, which is not which is something that's new for the ILC community, something new for the mirrorless world. So it's really a purpose-built, tried-and-true sensor that we made for this camera to be able to give you the best possible image quality. And so far from what we've seen, it's just, it's insane. So That's awesome. So you had mentioned a little bit about the low noise or the low light capabilities. What in comparison to like the a7 III would you say this low light capability would be? It's a great camera, the Alpha 7 III, but it's just, it's just not in not the, the same, same world as this camera. Yeah, so, I mean, I really still feel like the Alpha 7 uh, S Mark II was still kind of the king of the high ISO world. Um, and this camera just takes it to a whole nother level. So you're gonna get a stop and a half to two stops, even better high ISO performance than what you had on that camera. But beyond just the, the, the noise, when people think of high ISO, they just think of the noise and that's it. But really, when it comes down to it, there's a lot more to it. It's not just better noise, but in those high ISOs, you're going to get much better color reproduction. So it's not muddy and you're not going to get that same look, but it's also going to give you much better detail. Because when people looked at cinema cameras, even though they weren't as sensitive and didn't have as high of ISO as like an Alpha 7 S Mark II, they still had better performance and better image quality and a better look at those high ISOs. It's because not only were they 10 bit, or higher, but because they had better, better color reproduction in those high ISOs, they had better detail reproduction. So we incorporated that into this camera as well. And one thing that we learned over the last five years is how to make the best cinema quality for uh, full frame cameras like the FX9, like the Venice. And we utilize those technologies we learned with those cameras and put that into this camera. So that way they works, it works as an awesome B cam for those. And it also works as obviously a standalone cinema camera all by itself and a videographer camera all by itself. And that high ISO, again, it's like, it's literally a scene in the dark. It goes beyond human vision. I know it sounds cheesy, but the camera can see beyond what you can see. Like it can see better than what I can see. And it's not something that's brand new, but again, we've made it even better but it can also focus in that low light too. And that's something that we've never had in the A7S series before. And I know that we'll probably get into that, but I just kind of get excited. No, no, that's great. And you'd, you'd kind of hinted on it a little bit. What is the color uh, space that you're getting with this camera? Um, you know, what are the, the specs in that regard as far as your, your recording settings? So in recording, we have S-Log2, we have S-Log3, we have uh, S-Gamut and S-Gamut Cine. Um, but when it comes down to like the actual color science behind it, it's just hard to describe because it's not really anything that's described or put down on paper. It's just the theory that we put into it that just gives you much nicer color reproduction than what we've had before. But we did create this new thing called creative looks. We used to have creative styles, now we have creative looks. And these are more video centric than what we've had before. And it just enables optimized like shooting. So that way, instead of doing S log and then having to output it after the fact and have to use a nonlinear editor to edit it and color grade. Now we have these looks that have nine parameters with really wide um, adjustments that you can actually tailor your own look right there in the camera and have it flattened. So that way you can send it out really quick for much easier editing. Pretty cool. I just wanted to add something about color science, you know, like Mike's talking about all these gobbledygooky terms and stuff, but in the real world, what, what, what this means is that the, the um, skin tones, for instance, if you're shooting at uh, 250 ISO, 1000 ISO, skin still looks like skin. Um, so if you're shooting an animal at night, like some kind of a nocturnal animal, uh, whatever the, the, you know, the fur color is, it's going to be more accurate than any ever before. Um, and then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I think that the uh, A7S II and the, a, the ori original A7S, neither one of those had phase detect autofocus at all. Is that correct? Neither one. Yeah, they're both contrast. Yeah. yeah, so this is like a triple whammy. So when you're talking about really excellent autofocus, we're talking about Number one, the A7S III has phase detect autofocus, and it's got more autofocus points than an A92. 
which is insane. So it's not just better autofocus in the middle of the frame, like some of the competitors, but all the way to the edge, 92% of the entire imaging area is autofocus points are covering all that. So it's, it's, it's just like, it's the most capable, you know, camera to use when there's no light. But one thing people always forget too about color science, they forget about, um, you know, when they talk about the low light capabilities of the A7S series, it also works in reverse. Uh, I'm a guy that spent a lot of, a lot of time shooting noon start NFL games when the light is horrifically harsh and terrible and trying to get a face out, you know, a, a very dark complected face out of a football helmet at noon uh, when someone's backlit is nearly impossible. But the A7S III has the ability to do things with its built-in natural dynamic range that would be impossible in harsh bright light, not just the low light. Who is the customer that the A7S III is made for? Great question. So like I said before, it's, it's, we purpose built it for a customer in mind. I didn't say who that customer was. So it's really designed for that high-end videographer, for that person that's just looking for video acquisition. People always ask me like, what's the best product? And I always, and I don't, a lot of people always just go right to the best product that we make. Well, we have multiple high-end products. So if you're a stills photographer, we purpose built that Alpha 7R Mark IV for those stills photographers that need the ultimate resolution. If you're the sports and photojournalist photographer, we purpose built that Alpha 9 Mark II for that purpose. And this camera, we really did purpose built it for the videographer. I would say it's 80% videography and then 20% stills. Um, but this, the camera really was designed for that videographer, for that video acquisition. So what's the actual uh, maximum recording capability in video for the A7S III? So the camera can do, again, I like to have this thread that's on this camera that's talking about no compromises. And we talked about the, the sensor of the camera and then that's the best capability of doing 4K video acquisition. So the camera can do 4K up to 120 frames per second, 10 bit, 422 internal, and you're able to get all intra now in every single frame rate. So without compromise, it's not like you can only do 120p, and but you'd have to sacrifice something else. You'd have to go down to 8-bit. Everything is all the same. So everything from 4K, 120p, and full HD at 240 frames per second is 10-bit internal, 422 uh, all intra, and you have all those recording modes available to you at all time. And, and also importantly, which is, it sounds like it should just be obvious, but it's not obvious. You have autofocus in all those modes as well, which is pretty <laughs> impressive. And the same level of autofocus, you don't lose anything in any of the shooting modes. Again, keeping on that thread of no compromises, one of the biggest hurdles in all of mirrorless cameras since they started to come out was overheating. We've had the issues in the past. Everyone has the issues. People currently still have issues. Um, and it's usually what separated professional video cameras from these interchangeable lens mirrorless cameras. So one of the biggest things, like when I said that we don't have the technology yet to give people what they need, I wasn't kidding. And the heat sink was one of the things that we needed to create. So even though it looks like an Alpha 7R Mark IV, even though it looks like the body of an Alpha 9 Mark II, it's actually completely redone from the inside out. And one of the biggest reasons being is that the heat sink encompasses most of the inside of the body. So we're able to have a passive heat sink, both in the front and the back of the camera, and giving us the ability to get record times that are over an hour in 4K 60p all intra, and for 4K 120p, we have over 30 minutes or until your card's full. Essentially, you can record until either your memory card's full or your battery dies. So the heat sink is so good that we're able to get almost unlimited record times um, in video. And what's impressive is we decided to make a passive heat sink because when you have a heat sink that has a fan built into it, two things happen. The camera is no longer heat, uh, dust and moisture resistant. And it also creates noise. So the onboard microphones will pick up any noise that the fan is creating. So we were able to, I always assumed that when we came out with this camera, we would make it bigger and we would add a fan and be able to make sure that we had the best, the best performance possible. But we were able to keep it the same size, the same weight of generally as the Alpha 7R Mark IV and the Alpha 9 Mark II while maintaining um, the dust and moisture resistance and still having almost unlimited record times is just really, really impressive. And when I say 
that we have 30 minutes plus of 4K 120p. People forget that at 4K 120p all intra, you're at 1200 megabits per second. So your memory cards are gonna fill right up. So until they invent higher, uh, higher storage and memory cards, that's gonna burn out, like I said, way faster than the camera will get overheated. It's not just how much time you can record, it's how fast it recovers. So we're able to recover almost immediately where you can, in my personal testing that I had, like I said, I was doing the heat sink test. I was able to record for an hour and 45 minutes and then I formatted my card, pressed it again, hour and 45 minutes, formatted the card, pressed it again, hour and 45 minutes. So it's just, it's a video camera. It's a real video camera without compromises designed for that professional, so. That's fantastic. And Patrick, how, how important is it to the end user that they have the capability to utilize a camera like this for an hour plus at a time without having to worrying about it overheating? Yeah, the, the two primary things that we do in the field is do interviews, which often uh, are able to be edited after the fact, and event coverage. And so, you know, it's been, I've been using um, uh, Alpha 7 and 9s for uh, quite a while to do wedding coverage, for instance. And I'll set up three remote cameras. But in order to get around the clip limit in the old days, I used to use uh, Atomos, uh, you know, video capture uh, recording units on each one. I don't have to do that anymore. It's great. Um, the other thing that's a huge significant thing is this, the advent of the, uh, the, the new CFAST cards, because without, um, without having, like, you, it's hard to get all this extra stuff, but then if you can't put it anywhere inside the camera, it doesn't really help you if you're trying to try out, like, fly lightweight, if you're running and gunning, so the new card options are phenomenal. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about the new cards and the fact that they use the same slots as the SD. So you can still use your old cards. So the camera's backwards compatible to old technology. And I have to be honest here, you know, I've, I've been begging Sony to use XQD cards for years and begging them, hey, you know, give me an A92, but give me XQD cards. And they probably knew they were going to use this technology, which is better than that. Um, but you know, I, so I had a lack of imagination of myself where they don't. And that's where, you know, I think a seven three is typical of Sony where a bunch of us that work as professionals in the field, capturing stills in motion, we keep asking for X, Y, and Z. And then we get like a whole half of alphabet as well when they actually deliver the new product. And that's, that's like exceeding expectations. That's what they're always talking about at Sony is exceeding expectations. And, I certainly think this camera easily covers that. And, and that brings up a great point. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about the new card system in the A7S III. So what we're introducing along with the camera is the new CF Express Type A. Um, so what, just from the size perspective, the card's actually smaller than SD, much smaller than CF Express Type B, but enables us to have higher reliability, faster speeds, and just um, better durability as well. So, and we're able to do at, at this point over 800 megabytes per second um, write speed to the card. So, and like what Patrick brought up, what's really nice about the system that we incorporated in the camera is that each slot can incorporate either an S, a CF Express Type A or an SD card, being somewhat backward compatible, like you said, to the SD cards. And it's so crucially important that there's two slots that are exactly the same, same speed, same yeah. everything. It's not like one's faster than the other, because when you do that, you create a compromise to the professional because mm -hmm. as professionals, as Patrick can attest, every time you shoot, you need to shoot redundantly. I can't just shoot to one card mm -hmm. and then hope everything is going to be fine because 999 out of a thousand times, it'll be fine because you can't risk losing that information that thousand times. So you have to shoot redundantly. And if you don't have two cards that are the exact same speed, you're gonna lose out and not be able to shoot at the maximum performance of the camera because you automatically have to now tailor it to the lowest common denominator, which is that slower slot. So being able to have two CF Express Type A cards is pretty, pretty impressive. That being said, you can do a lot of what the camera can do just to SD cards. So if you don't have to go run out and buy CF Express Type A just to be able to use the camera, one of the only thing, obviously, the overall performance of CF Express Type A is just better because your recovery is faster, your buffer is bigger, like the just general performance is better. 
But to do any of the video formats, the only thing that you crucially need to use CF Express Type A for is 4K, 120p, all intra. Again, because that's 1200 megabits per second to the sensor and uh, 800 megabits to 600 megabits per second to the card. So you need to have that CF Express Type A, but everything else um, you'll be able to shoot directly to uh, SD cards. So that's a, a good compromise. And that, and that brings up a huge point because there are a lot of cameras out there that are professional cameras that have a one, a high performance card slot and one that's not so high performance. So having two of them that match is incredible for sure. Yeah, it makes a big difference. And it, like, it's just a real purpose built camera for that professional. And we really didn't want to make any compromises. We weren't just making the camera for a spec sheet. We were making the camera to be like that real world workhorse that a professional can use day in and day out and just give you the best performance. So there are a few other changes, like you had mentioned to the body itself. What might some of the biggest things people notice um, right out the gate? So we're used to now the 7R Mark IV and the 9 Mark II. Um, so we're used to how this body looks now. But when we compare it, a lot of customers are still shooting with the Alpha 7S Mark II. And the world has just completely gone 360 since that camera. So the, this, this, the body itself is much more ergonomically friendly. The grip is better. The buttons are more pronounced. It's just better, has higher durability, better dust and moisture resistance. But compared to the 7R Mark IV and the 9 Mark II, the button layout is almost exactly the same. There is now a large designated record button on the top, which is critical for a lot of shooters, especially people who are doing, that are wearing gloves while recording. This way you can press the record button and have it readily available as you're doing that. On top of that, which most videographers rejoice, there's now a side mounted vary angle LCD screen which is incredible because now you can have the, you can be able to either do vlogging type situations or you can put the camera on a tripod against the wall and still be able to see what the camera is seeing. Now it's got the incorporated touchscreen as well. So you can also incorporate uh, the touch menu and be able to go through the menu settings even while the camera is facing you or facing forward. So that way I can go through the menu and do everything directly from in front of the camera, which is something that you normally wouldn't be able to do before. So if you have the camera, even from a cinematography standpoint on the dashboard of a car or in the corner or against the wall, you'll be able to utilize and see what the camera is seeing and go through the menu and do touch to focus and everything that you need to be able to do. So, and of course, battery is also incorporated in the physical portions of the camera as well. Mm -hmm. So your battery life, I mean, compared to nothing against the older cameras, but one of the biggest differences between the old camera system and the new camera system is we've changed from the W series battery to the Z series battery. So we're getting 60% better battery life than we got on the old camera system and even better battery life than what we're used to on the Alpha 9 Mark II and Alpha 7R Mark IV. So. So you had mentioned um, going through the menu system by touch. So what else has changed in that regard? Whole new menu system. So like Thanks I said, be before, God. yeah, we've been working on this for as, as PMR can, can attest, we've been working on this for a really long time, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours with hundreds of people to go through what they need in a menu system. So we've completely revamped it. I will be honest, when I first opened that box and I turned on the camera, I was like, what the heck? I was like, now I gotta learn a new menu system. I, I'm like really good at the old menu system now. I can do it blind and I can tell people off the top of my head. But within minutes, I realized how much more efficient it is because instead of it being horizontally placed where your subjects are on the top, then you have your folder underneath that, then you'd have to go into your folder to see what's in it. Now it's all vertically laid out. So you have your subjects on the left, your folders in the middle, and then you have what's within those folders on the right-hand side. But beyond that, it's just much more efficient. Everything is where it's supposed to be. Everything for autofocus is in one menu. Everything for image quality is in one menu. You don't have to jump around for different things, which is really nice. Another thing that we did is that if you're shooting video, the menu is actually designed and changes itself for video. If you're in stills, now when you go into the menu, your menu is designed for stills. You can still change your stills functions and things like that, but the organization is different, which is nice. And of course you can scroll and you can touch and you can do all those things to go through the menu as well. 
But this also brings up the fact that the camera is very manipulatable and very has a, a very high level of personalization. So as soon as you press that menu button, it brings you into your my menu, which means that you can customize and make your own custom menu. So you don't basically need to go into the rest of the menu ever again, because you know what you need to use and you can have a my menu that's customized and different for your still shooting and different for your, your video shooting. And of course, there's also nine customizable buttons on the outside of the camera. There's 16 different function buttons, uh, menu systems, uh, functions on the function button uh, menu. So the customization of this camera is really unique. And all those custom buttons that I was talking about are different for your stills as they are for your video. And of course, you can also sync them to be the same for both because our needs when we're shooting video are much different normally than when your needs for stills. So to be able to have that uniqueness and be able those little touches like that really make having this, this camera kind of be more of an extension uh, of your creativity, having it be, instead of having to always concentrate and manipulate your hardware to have it do what you need it to do, this just allows you to do the things you want to do and not have to worry about it. You just let the hardware do the work for you and you just need to quickly access it and be really as efficient as possible so you can get back to the things that are important, which is creating and making money. So that's awesome. I just, I just want to add that, you know, the menus are, you know, for people coming from Nikon can or wherever, the menus are often the most daunting thing that people face in the past. So this new massive change, this radical change of menus and how, it, how you work it and the fact that you can use your fingers, happy fingers moving around, uh, it's really going to be helpful to uh, salespeople at camera counters like you guys at the Bedford. It's going to be it's just going to, people are going to be able to acclimate so much faster and um, it's just great. It's really, really a nice way. And I would encourage people that may have you know heard about Sony in the past and they like they freaked out when they saw the menus, it might be time to look again. Also, when Sony makes a big change like this, this change is not going to be only found in the A7S III from now on. It's going to be in everything that comes after, just like they've always done. And so that's really a great thing too, because you know, and I'm hoping like Mike probably doesn't know, I don't know, but I'm hoping that the menu system might be backwards compatible to A92, for instance. And if Sony can do that, they will in a firmware update. You know, you don't have to go buy an S version of the A92 to get the latest thing because they, they want to give it to you. So I just am loving the fact that Sony is so, they just give us all kinds of things that I'm used to spending a bunch of money for and having to change out my pro bodies all the time. I'm, I've been conditioned by Canon and Nikon both through the years. Oh, now I got to get a you know 1DX Mark II. Now I got to get a 1DX Mark IIn. Now I got to it's just our you know D4S, D4, 5 D4, It's just endless. So I just so appreciate the value and that when you buy um, when you buy the A7S even the three, you're going to get a camera that comes in a box, um, but that camera can radically change itself in just a few months. Like when they figure out how to do more cool stuff with it and with the sensor, especially, they're going to add value to that camera after the purchase. And this is unique to Sony. I just love this, this kind of headspace that they have. The primary user, like you had mentioned, is about 80% video, 20% photos, in your opinion. Now, I know that all of the guys that are going to be utilizing this day in and day out for the video functionality they're going to want to know what has been done for the audio capturing capabilities for this camera. Audio is just as important as video. I mean, what's video without audio, right? So Sony, we've always been hybrid centric. We've always been making these cameras that excel as much in stills as they do in video. So we created a thing called the multi-interface shoe quite a long time ago. So when you look at the hot shoe on the camera, it's not a regular hot shoe. You look at it and you can see all these pins inside. And the reason why we did this is because it enables us to use real audio, I like to say, professional audio. And it enables us to be able to put on a real XLR microphone on there with two XLR inputs without having to adapt it to um, a microphone jack and get, you know, it's like putting a, when you connect an XLR to a microphone jack, it's like taking a JPEG and then putting it through a raw processor. It just doesn't make sense. And we've actually increased that, our audio performance on the Alpha 7R Mark IV, where we incorporated now a digital interface instead of an analog interface, giving us much better signal to noise ratio and just bringing audio kind of into the future. 
and being able to get even higher bit rates and higher audio quality. And on this camera, we were able to incorporate four channel audio. So even on our XLR K3M that's been out for about a year, it's had a hidden feature because we haven't had a product that's been able to embrace it. But now this camera is able to do four channel 24 bit uncompressed linear PCM audio, which is something that only high end video cameras have been able to do in the past. So you're able to get the most professional audio to go along with your unbelievable image quality. Just for me in the field, this XR, you know, 3M is phenomenal. It sounds so good. And uh, I can't remember the model number, but the little one, Mike, the, the, the shotgun one that just sits on the shot, hot shoe that's yep. just, that thing sounds so good. I was just doing a whitewater, I was doing whitewater kayaking with a 600 F4 uh, just a couple of days ago for a video. And I put that little, you know, digital mic on the camera and I thought, man, I don't know if it's going to work. You know, I'm like standing right in front of a river that's a class four river. And I'm kind of shouting and stuff and trying to make it work. And of course I get home and it's, it's perfect. Like, it's like, it's like there was an audio engineer from NPR there helping me the whole time. So, um, but in this feature that where this four channel feature has been available on the FS7 uh, and the FS7 II for a long time. A lot of people didn't even know it existed, but audio guys knew because uh, they're like, holy crap, that's awesome. And uh, anytime you can capture your audio on the same exact media as your video just reduces the chance for problems. And so having this access to four channel audio is good. And, and you might think four channel, why would I need that? You can also set each level differently. So you can have like a high clipping and a low, you know, so sometimes people in an interview, they start out really loud and then they get really soft. And you can, if you have these two channels of audio, you're guaranteed to have that. So you could like literally do two channel audio on this camera eventually, and then have safety audio tracks as well. So if somebody starts shouting, you're not distorted. So there's just, on the audio side of things, it's, it's really easy to get an audio person really excited about the Sony system, but getting four channels out of a DI product is something brand new, it's awesome. So tell me a little bit about the inputs and the outputs for the A7S III. Absolutely. So one big change that we've had for the, the inputs and outputs is that we now have a full-size HDMI, which as Patrick's saying right now, videographers rejoice, right? Because not Thank only does you. it have Thank great you. throughput, <laughs> but it's also just compatible with everything. It's more durable. If you break one, you can run down the street. I wish I could say you can run down the street to Radio Shack, RIP Radio Shack, but you can just run down the street and get something new and you can just get another one. So it's, it's just something that's a welcome addition for everything. A lot of the external recorders have HDMI, the TVs have HDMI, just, it makes sense. It's just easier. It's what people wanted. Again, making a product for the thing that people want. Beyond the HDMI, we now have what I like to call the super USB-C port. And that super USB-C port can do two things. The first thing that I think is the most impressive for me is that it has unlimited, it's got the power delivery. Because we've always had the, we've always had the ability to, to charge the camera while being uh, with, via USB, but the camera would drain faster and it would lose power faster than it records, than it's being powered. So now with the new power delivery USB-C, it actually charges the camera faster than it drains. So that way you never have to take the battery out. It'll always be at 100% in almost every single shooting situation. So if you have the camera on a rig or you have the camera or doing time lapses, you can actually just plug this thing in via USB-C to an external USB power brick if it has a better, like the good enough voltage and you can shoot as long as you want. You go on vacation, you're in the mountains and you're doing a trip, you don't have to worry about your batteries nearly as much because you can just charge it via USB-C, which is pretty incredible. So this gives you a lot of flexibility, not just for video, but for stills and just in general, because your power issues now are kind of a thing of the past. But what the other, the second part of that super USB-C is that it's five gigabit per second speeds. So it's a super speed USB-C, meaning that you're able to do and connect it to uh, an external uh, USB-C to ethernet port. So you can get thousand base T ethernet out of it as well. So even though it doesn't have an ethernet port like the Alpha 9 Mark II, with the simple addition of an adapter, you're gonna get the same FTP functionality with this camera that you do with that camera because this camera is, can also be one of the best remote cameras ever made. So when you connect it via 
ethernet, you're gonna be able to control the camera, you're gonna be able to change the settings in the camera, you're gonna be able to transfer data at an alarmingly fast rate at 1,000 gigabits per second, you're gonna be able to do things that are usually only reserved for really, really, really super high-end photojournalist cameras like the Alpha 9 Mark II. No, that's fantastic. I just, I just wanna, I wanna add to that, that I, when I drive around between assignments, I just plug my camera in like to my cell phone charger in the car, it's so cool. And I remember going to lunch a couple of weeks ago with a friend of mine who still shoots Canon. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm charging my camera. And he just, oh my God, because that's like <laughs> an impossibility for them. It's kind of cool. Simple, simple, but it works for Sony. It's great. And now it charges just as fast as the, the battery charger that mm -hmm. it comes with, as the QC1. So it's the same, yep. same speed. So now you're going to be able to charge in car if you have a high enough voltage um, and be able to and charge just as fast as the real plug-in AC adapter. That's cool. Yeah. So with the, the HDMI output on this camera, is there any difference between the output resolution or quality for video capabilities um, in comparison to the internal recording? One of the biggest wow specs for me on this camera is that now via HDMI, we're gonna be able to do 16-bit raw output at 4K 60p. So it's the highest bit rate raw. It's so high that there's no external recorders at this point that can actually ingest that 16 bit raw. There will be soon, I'm sure there'll be, I mean, uh, Atomos already made announcements saying that they're gonna make compatible mm -hmm. products very quickly, but we can do 16 bit raw output. But the amazing thing is because of that Bion's XR processing engine, we can do that and we can also record any other format that we want to the memory cards inside the camera. So I can be doing 4K 60p 16 bit raw out to recorder while doing 4K 120p all intra to both CF Express type A cards in the camera, which is craziness. Like I've never even- Hold, that, that hold means, on, uh, hold on. It was did, above and beyond anything I ever thought. Did, did you just <laughs> say you could do two different recording settings, one internal and out external at the same time though? Yes. That's, that's pretty awesome. That is yeah. pretty awesome. <laughs> and remember that if you choose to only do the 16 bit out, the camera's not gonna die in 30 minutes or overheat because it's idling. It doesn't have to write, it doesn't have to put, so you can just roll on that for a long, long time. Right, Mike? Yep. And that's awesome. Yeah, it's unlimited, yeah, so. Yeah. I mean, I will say 16 bit raw 4K 60P, <laughs> I don't, I haven't done the math to what the bit rate will be, but a I lot. Can, yeah, you're not going to get much big. time on a, on a 256 gigabyte uh, <laughs> hard drive. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so kind of shifting gears a little bit more towards the 20% side of the camera when it comes to the photo realm. What are some of the specs in relation to the photo side of the A7S II, A7S III? Like I said before, I mean, this is still a very capable camera in terms of the still side. It's the camera that I'm, I choose myself. One of the biggest things is that the S has never been known for autofocus, right? So we had the Alpha 7S Mark II, like Patrick said before, it was a contrast-based autofocusing system. And that's why I personally moved away from it because it couldn't do what I needed to do. But now we have a focusing system that incorporates some of the same technologies from the Alpha 9 Mark II, 759 phase detection autofocusing points, and we're able to focus in complete darkness at negative 6 EV in all shooting modes. Not a lot of asterisks, so you're going to be able to shoot at, you know, F2 in all shooting modes, even with negative 6 EV. And then you're also going to be able to have the world's best and most advanced focusing. So you're gonna be able to have pupil autofocus. I don't even say eye autofocus anymore because sometimes eye autofocus from other systems focuses on like the eyelash and the mm -hmm. eyebrow. We have pupil mm -hmm. autofocus that's 30% faster and more reliable than what we've had in the past. So think about that. So I can be moving, the subject can be moving very fast and I can track that pupil wherever it goes. It changes everything. So I can shoot at a 135, 1.8 doing an interview or shooting sports or shooting basketball, which I've done before, and be able to track the pupil of that athlete's or that subject's eye, which just changes the game. And we have the new real-time tracking um, in terms of subject tracking. So you can touch the screen to be able to track a moving subject. I can actually just, or put my focusing point and be able to do subject tracking because with the new Bion's XR processing engine, we also are able to incorporate even more AI into the camera itself. So the camera is able to track a subject unbelievably well. 
And this works the same as it does in stills as it does for video. No matter what shooting mode you're in, you're able to get all these features. In stills mode, you do get a little bit more features on the autofocusing side because you also incorporate um, continuous animal IAF as well. So you can photograph birds and dogs and cats and lions or whatever you want. So for that wildlife photographer, you're really going to have a great time getting focus acquisition because you're going to be able to track the, the eye of that moving subject. And it just, it changes the way we shoot because again, especially as videographers, they don't think autofocus. They think manual focus because they've never had a system that they can rely on. They've never had a system that works and it works all the time. So being able to get a hundred percent um, hit rate, being able to shoot at 120 frames per second, and each one of those 120 frames has got the pupil in focus is just something that no one ever thought you could do. And you can do that in this camera. And it really just, it really does change the way you shoot. It's awesome. And, and being able to view what you're shooting, what's changed on this camera compared to the rest of the Alpha series? I know what you're getting at. You're getting at the world's best viewfinder, right? So That's exactly it. <laughs> 9.44 million dot electronic viewfinder with a 41 degree angle of view what so it's like it literally when i first put it up to my eye because i didn't have the specs of it i just had the camera so i put it up to my eye i was like whoa what did i just look at so you put it up to your eye and it's actually you're looking through virtual reality goggles you're looking through and your scene that you're seeing is better than reality. It's this huge wide immersive scene that's at nine and a half million dots, which is just crazy. And because of the processing engine, you're able to do nine and a half million dots at 120 frames per second all the time. So not only does it have unbelievable resolution and in the world's first highest resolution EVF, but it also is the biggest and has the awesome fluid motion for it as well. So it really gives you the best experience possible. And if it's too wide for you, it's actually our first variable angle viewfinder as well. So we can go from 41 down to 33 for people that have glasses on. So it really helps you when you look through the viewfinder, you can still keep the same resolution, the same speed, but still have just the angle of view um, a little bit smaller. So people with glasses can enjoy it a little bit better. So when it comes to stills on this camera, what are, one, we talked about the resolution of the images, but what are the frames per second that this camera can facilitate, as well as how many shots can I be shooting before I have a buffer or, or things of that nature? The camera is able to shoot it. It's got a mechanical shutter and a fully electronic shutter. Um, it does 10 frames a second in either mechanical or silent. And because, like I said before, the sensor readout is so fast, that you're able to get very, very good silent electronic shutter performance. A lot of cameras out there have electronic shutter or silent shutter, but not all of them are created equal. One of the things that separates the Alpha 9 Mark II from all of the cameras in the world is that it's able to have a read speed of the sensor that's faster than anything. So you can shoot in silent and be able to capture the motion of a golf club at 32 thousandths of a second, where this camera has the read speed that's almost as fast as the Alpha 9 Mark II, so you're gonna get very similar performance at 10 frames a second. So it's really, really capable as a mechanical or silent shutter camera. In terms of the buffer, one of the other advantages of having a 12 megapixel sensor is not just the dynamic range that we talked about, not just the high ISO, but I can have over a thousand uncompressed raw plus JPEGs at the same time. I was able to get 1,780 uncompressed raw plus JPEGs in a burst, which is way more than I ever wanted or needed, but I was able to do it and that's pretty impressive. And now we have this new format that we incorporated, which is HEIF. So it's something that's been on cell phones for some time because they have smaller sensors and it's able to process it faster, but it's the first time in an alpha camera. And what this format is, is similar to the way we have H.265 in video, where we're just able to have more compression and more creative and more um, better compression, essentially. So you're able to get 10-bit 422 um, output, but in a flattened image. Essentially, it's taking your raw and then bringing it down to a 10-bit high color space image. So you're going to get the same compression, the same size, essentially, as a JPEG, but much better image quality. And now in the industry, it used to be that most software couldn't read the HEIF files, but now almost every single software that's out there, including the operating systems, can read the HEIF. So it's really a nice addition to the lineup. And even when you're shooting uncompressed raw plus HEIF, 
you're still going to get over a thousand pictures in uh, in your buffer, which just is mind blowing and is is really awesome. So it really is a really capable stills camera at the same time as a video camera. I, I'm excited about this new uh, HIF file format because it's uh, it's been in use for by, but with Apple for a long time in their phones. But it, it may be the answer to what a lot of us, a lot of photographers want to shoot like a small raw, which is, you know, we've been asking for that for a long time. This could be kind of in between a raw image and a JPEG. Also, I think it's going to be really interesting. Like, I can't wait to get my hands on the camera to do some testing on these new files. Um, just see how good they are. It may erase some of the, you know, the fact that it's a 12 megapixel rather than a 24. You know, it really, for most of us that shoot events, weddings, things like that, you typically don't make massive files. Um, even if you're a pro uh, working for Getty or AP or whatever, typically your delivery is going to be 300 DPI, seven by 10 inches. So, you know, the, even if you cut your frame in half in cropping, you still have plenty of real estate left in the center with a 12 megapixel camera to do this. If you're able to get all this dynamic range and all this extra color management, all this color science and this new file, it could really sort of, um, you know, be a huge improvement for workflow. And I'm, I'm stoked about that. I can't wait to try it and, you know, check it out. You remember the one D days where we were, on the floor with the eight megapixel camera, we're like, oh my God, eight megapixels, we can do whatever yep. we want. Yep. So 12 exactly. megapixels gives you a 13 by 19 and that's enough for me. I mean, I know a lot of people are used to cropping now these days because we have 60 megapixels and the best possible image quality you can get in stills. But to me, 12 megapixels is, is great. It's a lot. I mean, I, I went to school to not crop, crop in camera, crop by, with your feet. And then, uh, so I loved, I think 12 megapixels is fine. I'll take the advantages of it over anything else. So I'm, I'm with you. I think 12 megapixels is a lot. So, you know, one other thing too, and this is hard, you can't put it in a brochure or in a, in a like a PowerPoint very easily, but the A7S has always had a different look to it. It's had a very unique uh, look and it's also, it, it's a file that's rubber, you know, because of the dynamic range, once you get it into Lightroom or Capture One or whatever you're using in post, I call them rubber files because they're, they're bendy and stretchy and um, these are really good files for people that make mistakes. If you screw up something or the light radically changes, like for concert photography, especially where you're having lighting cues every second or something changed blue and then it's red and then it's yellow and all that stuff. The A7S is always going to be the camera choice for that because it just, so, it just sees. And now that it can autofocus too, it's a triple threat. I mean, on so many levels, um, I, I'm really pumped about it. I can't wait to get one. You know, I, I think it's funny that we haven't even mentioned this yet because it's almost become a norm and an expected type of feature. But the A7S III still has five axis in body stabilization. I mean, it's, it's an incredible feature that I think a lot of times we even overthink or, or, or look over because it's been such a, a prominent aspect of these cameras. Yeah. yeah, one of the staples in this lineup since the Alpha 7S Mark II has been the in-body stabilization. So compared to that camera, we actually have two stops better. So our five and a half stops in-body stabilization. And it works in conjunction also with lenses that have the stabilization in the lenses as well. So you can utilize both at the same time, giving you really good performance. The, one of the big things on this camera is that it's the first alpha camera to have active steady shot. And what active steady shot is, it's only capable because we have the new processing engine. So we're able to have really gimbal like stabilization in full optical stabilization. So there's no digital stabilization whatsoever. It's all being done with the optics, either through the lens or on the sensor itself. So we are gonna have a very slight crop, but we're still gonna have full pixel readouts. So you're still reading out 4K worth of pixels, but you're able to have stabilization that literally looks like you're on a gimbal. There's lots of footage out there that's been done from some people that just while you're walking with the camera, it looks like I'm using one of those $1,200 gimbals um, and able to have that experience without having to lug around all that gear. So you can be really nimble, you can be really quick and be really efficient in the way you shoot because you're gonna get really truly good uh, and usable active image stabilization, which just changes the way you shoot, which is 
Awesome. You know, also I want to tag on to that, you know, when you do take all that technology and you put it on a gimbal, it's going to be so fluid. And yeah. the reason why I bring this up is anybody that's really used a gimbal for like half a day, it kills your back. It is a very, very, you're, you're trying to heel toe and you're trying to be smooth as you walk and maybe you're walking backwards or sideways. It takes a lot of energy to be steady. And this, I think the A7 III is going to help people that use a gimbal a lot, even every day, to go for much, much longer and stay in the game to like keep the, you know, the production value high where it's really stable and fluid. Um, so there's a huge hidden advantage in this, in this, uh, this part. Uh, you know, I think probably the next question that most people will want to know is one, what's the price and availability of this camera? I'm happy to say it's coming out pretty quick. So September 24th is going to be the customer delivery date and it's $3,500, which is incredible because most people that I talk to, when you look at these types of specs, most people that we talked to prior to this were like 5,000, 5,500, because it truly is when we see specs like this, we think of 10,000, 15,000. So to be at $3,500, it really means that it really does change the industry because people are going to be able to get image quality. They never thought they could get. And now it's going to be more approachable for people on a limited budget. I know $3,500 is a ton of money, but for, to get this type of video quality is something that you normally had to spend at least uh, into the tens of thousands of dollars to be able to get, which is amazing. That's awesome. And I know everybody's going to be excited to hear that it's coming soon. Um, so uh, with that, I mean, do you guys have any closing statements that you want to make or, or points that you want to bring up before we end this? I've got an A7S story I'd love to tell. You can use it or not use it, but it's, it's pretty cool. It's funny. Okay, go for it. Um, a couple of years ago, I was out uh, working WPPI, and um, WPPI is in Vegas, and it's really close to some beautiful national parks. And these guys went out to Death Valley, um, and they were shooting at night. And they were doing star trails because it's so black out there. It's great. And they got all into their shoot and they were doing great. And they were both using A7S cameras to do this. And it kind of got to be 3 a.m. and they needed to get back. And they packed up all their gear and they couldn't find the car keys. And it's pitch black, you know, in the middle of the night, there's no light. And they cannot figure out where these car keys are and they can't move the car to use the headlights. And so finally, after like looking for 45 minutes on the ground, they thought, hey, we'll put a lens on the camera and see if we can find them. And they found them in two minutes. They found them on the ground because the camera could literally see what they could not. And this is like, you know, this camera is better than the one I just described in that story. So um, the last thing I want to say about a seven S three is that there are pictures to be made with this camera that have never been made before. And part of it will be up to photographers and videographers to imagine situations they could use this technology and that it wasn't really possible before so to a great extent we don't really know who's going to use it because like this kind of thing has not been available in a box this big ever before so i think it's going to be we're going to have to go six months from now to see you know what people did with it uh looking backwards and i think that's very exciting i'm so glad you said that uh pmr because exactly what you said is what I've been feeling for a while. I think the capabilities of this camera, we don't even know what the capabilities of this camera. No. I'm really excited to see what people create with it because even though we've had high so before, that's great, but we've never had it to this level, even though we, no. but now we've also added um, the autofocus performance and the 120. So you're going to be able to shoot in almost no light, but be able to shoot at 240th of a second to do your 120p with while focusing on the pupil of the eye, those things have never been said in the same sentence no, until now. No. So it's like being able to see what people are going to create with this is just going to blow our minds. And I'm just really excited and I'm proud to be part of a company that truly appreciates and, and works as hard as we do for the, for the customer, for that target customer. We don't just want to make products and be like, hey, everyone's going to want it. It's going to be great. But we actually want to make people's lives easier. We want to make their professions better and have them be able to be more successful. And I truly mean it that this camera just isn't compromised in any way that we want it to make the best tool. 
And I really do appreciate the fact that I want videographers and I want creators to just worry about creating. I want this to be a tool that's so technologically advanced that you forget about it. I want it to be a tool that does everything that it needs to do without you having to worry about it. So it's just an extension of your art. It's just an extension of your creation. It's just a tool for you to use that you don't have to worry about. It does what it's supposed to do. It does it when it's supposed to do it. And it's reliable and it's uh, dependable. And you just have to worry about making money. You just have to worry about making that image and being the best that you can be and just let the camera do its job. So, and I, I mean, and that's just our motto is yeah. just making the best possible product. Just tagging on to that as a user, you know, I so appreciate Sony being in a dialogue, a real dialogue with me as a professional. Do you guys really listen to us? I'm in a relationship with a camera company. I've owned lots of cameras, but I've never been in a relationship with a camera company before. And the A7S III is proof of that relationship. This camera doesn't exist without a camera company listening so closely and then trying to cater to the needs that we're asking for and then giving us a whole bunch of bonus, extra stuff. Every time they do it, it's the same. It's, it's pretty cool. I'm proud to be associated with Sony and I, I couldn't do any better for my clients that I work for by using a different uh, tool. So it's awesome. So there you have it. That's the A7S III. Thank you so much to Patrick, Patrick Murphy Racy and Michael Bulbolo. Um, and if you guys have questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can get our contact info from bedfords.com. If you wanna pre-order yours, go ahead and visit us online at bedfords.com or your local store. I'm Luke from Bedford Camera and Video and we'll catch you next time.